Jules Michelet French L me L the 21st of August 1798 to the 9th of February 1874 was a French historian He was born in Paris to a family with Huguenot traditions In his 1855 work Histoire de France History of France Jules Michelet was the first historian to use and define the word renaissance rebirth in French as a period in Europe's cultural history that represented a drastic break from the Middle Ages which he loathed creating a modern understanding of humanity and its place in the world Historian François Ferret wrote that his history of the French Revolution 1847 remains the cornerstone of all revolutionary historiography and is also a literary monument." His aphoristic style emphasized his anti-clerical republicanism. <laughs> Early life His father was a master printer, not very prosperous, and Jules assisted him in the actual work of the press. A place was offered him in the imperial printing office, but his father was able to send him to the famous college or Lycée Charlemagne, where he distinguished himself. He passed the university examination in 1821, and was soon appointed to a professorship of history in the College Roland. Soon after this, in 1824, he married. This was one of the most favorable periods ever for scholars and men of letters in France, and Michelet had powerful patrons in Abel Francois Villemain and Victor Cousin, among others. Although he was an ardent politician, having from his childhood embraced republicanism and a peculiar variety of romantic free thought, he was above all a man of letters and an inquirer into the history of the past. His earliest works were school textbooks. Between 1825 and 1827 he produced diverse sketches, chronological tables etc., of modern history. His Précis of the Subject, published in 1827, is a sound and careful book, far better than anything that had appeared before it, and written in a sober yet interesting style. In the same year he was appointed maître de conférences at the École Normale Supérieure. Four years later, in 1831, the introduction of l'histoire universelle showed a very different style, exhibiting the idiosyncrasy and literary power of the writer to greater advantage but also displaying, according to the Encyclopædia Britannica 11th edition, the peculiar visionary qualities which made Michelet the most stimulating, but the most untrustworthy not in facts, which he never consciously falsifies, but in suggestion of all historians. Topic. Record office The events of 1830 had placed him in a better position for study by obtaining him a place in the record office, and a deputy professorship under Guizot in the literary faculty of the university. Soon afterwards he began his chief and monumental work, the Histoire de France that would take thirty years to complete. But he accompanied this with numerous other books, chiefly of erudition, such as the Urs Choisis de Vico, the Memoirs de Luther écrits par Louis Meme, the Origines du droit français, and somewhat later the La Prosis des Templiers. 1838 was a year of great importance in Michelet's life. He was in the fullness of his powers, his studies had fed his natural aversion to the principles of authority and ecclesiasticism, and at a moment when the revived activity of the Jesuits caused some pretended alarm, he was appointed to the chair of history at the Collège de France. Assisted by his friend Edgar Quinet, he began a violent polemic against the unpopular order and the principles which it represented, a polemic which made their lectures, and especially Michelet's, one of the most popular resorts of the day. He published, in 1839, his Histoire Romaine, but this was in his graver and earlier manner. The results of his lectures appeared in the volumes Du Préter, De la Femme et de la Famille and Le Pupil. These books do not display the apocalyptic style which, partly borrowed from Laminus, characterizes Michelet's later works, but they contain in miniature almost the whole of his curious ethico-politico-theological creed a mixture of sentimentalism, communism, and anti-sacerdotalism, supported by the most eccentric arguments, but urged with a great deal of eloquence. The principles of the outbreak of 1848 were in the air, and Michelet was one of many who condensed and propagated them, his original lectures were of so incendiary a kind that the course had to be interdicted. However, when the revolution broke out, Michelet, unlike many other men of letters, did not attempt to enter active political life, and merely devoted himself more strenuously to his literary work. 
Besides continuing the great history, he undertook and carried out, during the years between the downfall of Louis Philippe and the final establishment of Napoleon III, an enthusiastic Histoire de la Révolution Française. <laughs> Minor books After Napoleon III's coup d'état, Michelet lost his position in the record office when he refused to take the oaths to the empire. The new regime kindled afresh his republican zeal, further stimulated by his second marriage to Athenae a lady of some literary capacity and republican sympathies. While his great work of history was still his main pursuit, a crowd of extraordinary little books accompanied and diversified it. Sometimes they were expanded versions of its episodes, sometimes what may be called commentaries or companion volumes. The first of these was Les Femmes de la Révolution, 1854, in which Michelet's natural and inimitable faculty of dithyrambic too often gives way to tedious and not very conclusive argument and preaching. In the next, Lazo, 1856, a new and most successful vein was struck. The subject of natural history, a new subject with Michelet to which his wife introduced him, was treated, not from the point of view of mere science, nor from that of sentiment, but from that of the author's fervent pantheism. L'insect followed. It was succeeded by L'Amour, 1859, one of the author's most popular books. These remarkable works, half pamphlets half moral treatises, succeeded each other as a rule at the twelve months' interval, and the succession was almost unbroken for five or six years. L'Amour was followed by La Femme 1860, a book on which a whole critique of French literature and French character might be founded. Vincent van Gogh used a quote from La Femme on his drawing Sorrow. Then came Le Maire 1861, a return to the natural history class, which, considering the powers of the writer and the attraction of the subject, is perhaps a little disappointing. The next year 1862, the most striking of all Michelet's minor works, La Sorciere, made its appearance. Developed out of an episode of the history, it has all its author's peculiarities in the strongest degree. It is a nightmare and nothing more, but a nightmare of the most extraordinary verisimilitude and poetical power. This remarkable series, every volume of which was a work at once of imagination and of research, was not even yet finished, but the later volumes exhibit a certain falling off. The ambitious Bible de la Humanité a historical sketch of religions, has little merit. In La Montaigne the last of the natural history series, the tricks of staccato style are pushed even farther than by Victor Hugo in his less inspired moments, though, as is inevitable, in the hands of such a master of language as Michelet, the effect is frequently grandiose if not grand. Nose Filse 1869, the last of the string of smaller books published during the author's life, is a tractate on education, written with ample knowledge of the facts and with all Michelet's usual sweep, and range of view, if with visibly declining powers of expression. But in a book published posthumously, Le Banquet, these powers reappear at their fullest. The picture of the industrious and famishing populations of the Riviera is whether true de fact or not one of the best things that Michelet has done. To complete the list of his miscellaneous works, two collections of pieces, written and partly published at different times, may be mentioned. These are Les Soldats de la Révolution and Legendes Démocratiques du Nord. Michelet's Origines du droit français, Cherchez dans les symboles et les formules du droit universel was edited by Émile Faget in 1890 and went into a second edition in 1900. The publication of this series of books, and the completion of his history, occupied Michelet during both decades of the empire. He lived partly in France, partly in Italy, and was accustomed to spend the winter on the Riviera, chiefly at Hires. Topic. Masterpiece At last, in 1867, the great work of his life, Histoire de France, was finished. In the usual edition it fills 19 volumes. The first of these deals with the early history up to the death of Charlemagne, the second with the flourishing time of feudal France, the third with the 13th century, the fourth, fifth, and sixth with the Hundred Years' War, the seventh and eighth with the establishment of the rural power under Charles VII and Louis XI. The 16th and 17th centuries have four volumes apiece, much of which is very distantly connected with French history proper, especially in the two volumes entitled Renaissance and Reform. The last three volumes carry on the history of the 18th century to the outbreak of the Revolution. Michelet abhorred the Middle Ages, and celebrated their end as a radical transformation. 
He tried to explain how a dynamic renaissance could emerge from fossilized medieval culture. Topic: <laughs> Themes. Michelet has several themes running throughout his works. These included the following three categories: maleficent, beneficent, and paired. Within each of the three themes there are subsets of ideas that occur throughout Michelet's various works. One of these themes was the idea of paired themes, for example in many of his works he writes on grace and justice, grace being the woman or feminine and justice being more of a masculine idea. Michelet, additionally, used union and unity in his discussions about national history, and natural history. In terms of the Maleficent themes, there were subcategories. these were, themes of the dry, which included concepts such as, the machine, the Jesuits, scribes, the electric, irony, Goethe, the scholastics, public safety, fatalism, Hobbes, Molinos, Spinoza, Hegel. Themes of the empty and the turgid, which included the Middle Ages, the imitation, tedium, the novel, narcotics, Alexander, plethoric, engorged blood. Michelet also touches on themes of the indeterminate such as the Onet Homs, Condé, Chantilly Chaudé, Gambling, Phantasmorgia, Italian Comedy, White Blood, Sealed Blood. <laughs> <laughs> Academic reception Michelet was perhaps the first historian to devote himself to anything like a picturesque history of the Middle Ages, and his account is still one of the most vivid that exists. His inquiry into manuscript and printed authorities was most laborious, but his lively imagination, and his strong religious and political prejudices, made him regard all things from a singularly personal point of view. There is an unevenness of treatment of historical incidents. However, Michelet's insistence that history should concentrate on the people, and not only its leaders or its institutions, clearly drew inspiration from the French Revolution. Michelet was one of the first historians to apply these liberal principles to historical scholarship. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Political life. Incompromisingly hostile as Michelet was to the empire, its downfall in 1870 in the midst of France's defeat by Prussia and the rise and fall of the Paris Commune during the following year once more stimulated him to activity. Not only did he write letters and pamphlets during the struggle, but when it was over he set himself to complete the vast task which his two great histories had almost covered by a histoire du xixe siècle. He did not, however, live to carry it farther than the Battle of Waterloo, and the best criticism of it is perhaps contained in the opening words of the introduction to the last volume. Lodge me press. Age hurries me. The New Republic was not altogether a restoration for Michelet, and his professorship at the Collège de France, of which he always contended he had been unjustly deprived, was not given back to him. He was also a supporter of the Romanian National Awakening movements. Grave <inaudible> 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 Upon his death from a heart attack at Hires on 9 February 1874. Jules Michelet was interred there. At his widow's request, a Paris court granted permission for his body to be exhumed on 13 May 1876. On 16 May, his coffin arrived for reburial at Le Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. Michelet's monument there, designed by architect Jean-Louis Pascal, was erected in 1893 through public subscription. Family His second wife, Athenée Michelet, who survived him, had been a teacher in St. Petersburg. She opened a correspondence with him arising from her ardent admiration of his ideas, and they became engaged before they had seen each other. She assisted him in his labors and was preparing a new work, La Nature, at the time of his death. Bibliography <inaudible> 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 Michelet, Jules. The History of the French Revolution Charles Cox, Trans, 1847 online Michelet, Jules, 1844. The History of France. Trans, by W. K. Kelly, Volume 1 to 2 only. Michelet, Jules. On History, Introduction to World History, 1831, Opening Address at the Faculty of Letters, 1834, Preface to History of France, 1869. Trans. Flora Kimmich, Lionel Gossman and Edward K. Kaplan. Cambridge, UK, Open Book Publishers, 2013.
History of France v1 English translation History of France v2 English translation Topic See also Historiography of the French Revolution Topic References Topic Sources This article incorporates text from a publication now in the public domain, Chisholm, Hugh, ed. 1911. Michelet, Jules. Encyclopædia Britannica, 11th ed. Cambridge University Press. Topic. Further reading. Roland Barthes. Michelet, 1978. English translation by Richard Howard, 1992. Burroughs, Toby. Michelet in English. Bulletin, Bibliographical Society of Australia and New Zealand, 16.1, 1992, 23 plus. Online. Reviews all the translations into English. François Ferret, Mona Ozouf, 1989. A Critical Dictionary of the French Revolution. Harvard Up. pp. 981 to 90. Lionel Gossman. Jules Michelet and Romantic Historiography. In Scribner's European Writers, eds. Jacques Barzin and George Stade, New York, Charles Scribner's Sons, 1985, Volume 5, 571 to 606. Lionel Gossman, Michelet and Natural History: The Alibi of Nature. In Proceedings of the American Philosophical Society, Volume 145, 2001, 283 to 333. HAAC, Oscar A. Jules Michelet, G. K. Hall, 1982. Johnson, Douglas. Michelet and the French Revolution, Oxford, Clarendon Press, 1990. Kapoor, Stephen A. Jules Michelet, A Study of Mind and Sensibility, State University of New York Press, 1981. Rigny, Anne. The Rhetoric of Historical Representation, Three Narrative Histories of the French Revolution Cambridge University Press, 2002 covers Alphonse de Lamartine, Jules Michelet and Louis Blanc. Edmund Wilson. To the Finland Station, 1940, Chapter 3 Topic. External links Works by Jules Michelet at Project Gutenberg, all in French. Works by or about Jules Michelet at Internet Archive Works by Jules Michelet at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks